Okay, so today I want 102s primarily. Um, that means 101s, 103s, and 104s will get started out in the shop. 102s I don't think will take very long on class stuff. Again, I think we talked about this yesterday. Um, I saw something on Facebook this morning that said 1 to 78 inches of snow. Maybe, possibly, probably not, but could be or could not happen. <laughs> just yeah, you know, just some, somebody you know, just being ridiculous, you know. I think realistically, I think you're saying one to three inches that start around midnight tonight. Um, if you don't get the alerts on your phone, you need to make sure that you get them because we are it is much we are much quicker to uh, cancel classes because we can transfer so quickly into online stuff. Um, so if you get the a notice or announcement. Um, usually around 5 a.m. is usually when they make the decision. So um, if you get that and, and you see no school, awesome, go back to bed. Just know there, there are assignments due that day. And they may be as simple as uh, write your name in cursive and submit it or do these modules. You know, we need to be doing something. You probably write your name in cursive. But um, it may be something small. Maybe something big. Yeah, I know. I don't want to. I'm not trying to <laughs> tip the scale. You know, like I don't know. Is there a cursive generator? Um, so, I, it, it, and the the whole point of us continuing to do things online that allows us to get some of that um, class coursework done, so that we can spend more time in the shop. So, like something like that might look like go ahead and do lockout tag out um, that day tomorrow or whatever. So. Um, do those things, um, whatever it might be. I'll, I will give an announcement early in the day on what it is that you'll do. It doesn't look like it is. If, if for some reason we are out tomorrow, it really just looks like one day. Uh, I, and my gut says it probably isn't anything, anyways. I just don't. I just don't think that it is going to be anything. Okay, so let's just look quickly. 101s. Where are you guys at? Filing. Are you, are you done? You're done or not done? I'm not done. Are you done or not done? Okay. Um, okay. So 101s, head on out. 103s, head on out. 104s, head on out. 102s, and um, we're not done either, are you? Yours. Okay. Uh, even if you think you're close, go ahead and do, you know, do, get a little bit of extra time, um, and then we'll go over to real press today. We'll do that whole pocket in that thing, and then we'll be done. And then, um, yeah, I'll take 102s for a bit, and then we will move on out. It's a new day, new me. No more carbon and search breaking. I don't believe that. Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, let's talk about that. Um, yeah, and and you know, breaking is part of learning, so it's not an issue. Um, I thought that I fixed it, but it happened again. Okay, so typically in the part off, um, when you go down to the middle of the part, it's spinning much slower. Yeah. Um, so that you kind of sort of back off your feet rate just a little bit. Um, being over typically breaks an insert. Being under, which you said you were under first time, that usually does not. Usually it'll slide underneath it, leave that nub on there. You end up just kind of wiggling it off. Um, so it's a little bit odd that being under causes it to do it. But depending on speeds, feeds, you can end up with, uh, there's a lot of variables happening. Parting is probably one of the, Best thing that the lathe offers, but also one of the trickiest little things to do because you you, got, you just got to be right. And and you always really want to think about when you're parting off, give yourself a couple of extra thousands on the backside. Because um, I know for me, if I want if I want the part off to veer one way or another, it's toward the chuck. It almost always goes the opposite way for me. So I give myself just a little bit of extra space on that backside. So. Um, yeah, we'll get, so you got one more left, right? Okay, so when you get done, um, 
we'll make a necklace out of the ones that you destroyed. Nice and, away. Yeah, I did. Uh, so if you want to, if you um, are really entrepreneurial and want to collect all the carbide inserts that we break, um, they are worth uh, probably about twelve to fifteen dollars a pound right now. Um, Seems like a lot of work. Work. There's not a lot of pounds. They're heavy, though. Um, I think it's. collected all of them, but it's not broken. What do you do? So, so something, if you fill this thing up, yeah. probably 30 or 40 pounds. Yeah. Probably 30 pounds for sure. Yeah. So when I started here, we had random carbide inserts and broken carbide end mills everywhere. Yeah. So I collected them, and I bought, or I went to the post office, and I bought those. If it fits, it ships boxes. Mm -hmm. And so they go up to 60 pounds. And so I filled six of those at 55 pounds and um, taped them all up and sent them out. I mean, I got a couple thousand dollars in, in just dollars. So. One of those tubs was $500. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, it, the, the problem is that we, we don't really use a ton of them. But I mean, even if you got five pounds, I mean, it's really just ship it away really? and and then that's it. So they recycle it. So there's a place in Chicago that I send it to. Uh, there's only a couple of carbide recyclers in the U.S. But I mean, if you are entrepreneurial enough to do it, I'm OK with you doing it. Um, I don't want you to make it your business and I don't want you to be like, you enter, clump, oh, throw it in the thing. You know, this is just as we're I go through today. exactly. I, mean, I, don't, I don't want you to be like, look what I collected today. I'm gonna be like, hold on, we got we got a problem. Here. You want to take the new one here? Exactly. No, no, it just happened. So yeah, I mean, it's it's cool, but uh, so I will say this: I know of people who have gotten fired from places like Garden Denver um, and other places for taking a handful of carbide, throwing it in their lunchbox, and walking out every day with it. So like in places, big places, they might have 55 pound drum that they just fill up. Mm -hmm. And so when these things start, or five pound buckets, when they start to get full, um, it, it's easy to miss a handful of it, you know, every day. Um, but that's still stealing. So, you know, and it's definitely a fireable offense. So uh, you don't want to be the guy who loses your $100,000 a year job because you stole a handful of carbide. It's just not worth it. You know, no, nobody wants to tell that story. Why'd you lose your job? Well, uh, for five like days, exactly. I made a, made a couple hundred bucks, man. Um, there are better ways to make some extra money. Honestly, if you need 500 bucks and you just go tell your boss, he'll probably, he or she'll probably figure out a way that you can get some extra hours <laughs> and just do it legit. So uh, don't let that be your thing. All right. So a um, couple of problems maybe in threading. Last time we did you, when you started to thread here was your first time single pointing. So um, it is a little bit different. I would encourage you to try all both both kind of ways that I showed you on how to do it. Just kind of get the feel for it. One's definitely faster than the other. If, if we're doing bigger threads, we're going to do it. We're going to tackle it even more differently than what we did. Um, and the small parts that we were doing, you're really just driving in, going across. Uh, bigger threads, so say you're doing a three or four inch thread, uh, you'll you'll actually turn the compound to 29 and a half degrees and drive the tool in at an angle. So um, when you go in five thousandths, it's actually only going in two and a half thousandths. If you go in ten thousandths, it's only going in five thousandths because it's going at an angle. And, and so that allows all the pressure to be on the front cutting edge of the insert. And where it's not, it's less likely to shatter because it's not digging in on both sides of it. So um, most of the things that we turn are small, but we might grab a larger piece just so you can get a feel for threading on that. If you can single point well, Around here, you will be in the top 10% of machinists. Single point threading is probably the hardest thing. Whenever I would hire guys in, um, I would ask questions like that. How good are you at threading? Oh, yeah, really good. How good are you at single pointing? Not so good. Because they had, they had devised other methods of threading that were you know, handicapped, right? So like, you, you can't quite do it right. And so you get a bigger driver, you get a, you know, Velcro gloves, you know, you start to work your ways around it. But if you can single point well, then um, you really find yourself in that top level. So you want to try to really get good at, at doing things like single point. All right, so this week we are in module two, um, and it is 
it's really where we begin to work on the mill. Um, did do you guys work on the mill any last semester? Maybe a little bit at the end. Yeah. yeah. Um, same for us. We just worked a really small, small amount of time on the mill. So after you finish your screw jacks, which might be done today, um, I want you to go ahead and start making the fly cutter body. Uh, you've already got the print for that, or should have the print for that. Let's see if we can open it up. This is a pretty old print that we have. Um, so there's there. I think when, we, when you guys saw the material, we talked about how uh, to best turn this. I would turn this on one operation, chucking on this backside. Um, you, this way you don't have to worry about concentricity. So all, all the diameters show the same center line as you go. And because um, if, you, if you chuck on this and then turn this and then turn it around, you can put it in a collet. You can do it like that. Um, but you got this big chunk held on by this small area. You end up having to make your cuts a little bit smaller. Yeah, it, 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 it has a tendency to kind of move around just a little bit. So it's best if you can turn the whole thing and either part it off or turn the whole thing and then turn around and face off the backside. Put that chamfer on it. Chamfers are um, 50, 60 thousandths on that. Same thing with the radiuses. Um, make sure that when you do this corner, your turning inserts have a built-in 15 thousandths, 30 thousandths, I have to look at the inserts, uh, tool nose radius on there, but you need to have an additional um, 30, 40 thousandths on there to make it close to 50, 60 thousandths. So what we'll do is we'll grind up a quick little corner so that um, you can get that corner radius in there. The reason why you want to have that, you guys are already out. So. Um, the reason why you want to have that corner radius in there is anytime that you have a 90 degree square corner, it creates a pressure point. If this thing broke, it would be odd. But if there's a break point, this is where it is. And if you start to build in these radiuses into your parts early, then you don't have to worry about it later on because you've already built that kind of muscle memory in. And when you have something small, um, let's say you got a one inch shank and a five inch 10 inch diameter piece that you're going to make, you send it out to heat treat. Uh, there's a, if it's a square corner in there, pretty good chance it will come back cracked. Um, because when you heat treat it, you've got this large amount of material here, heats and cools at a different rate than the small shank. And so it, it, just, it just wants to separate. So building in those small radiuses uh, will help on those things. Make sure you put your radiuses and chamfers in there. Um, so after you turn it, We'll then take it to the mill, and the first thing that you want to do is you want to mill this flat. Okay, the flat's the first thing that you want to do. The only reason it's there is for orientation. So if you'll notice, the slot, the screws, everything are in the same orientation of that. Here's why I did this, because I actually don't like the flat on there. If you don't get done in a class period, you can reorientate this thing back in the alignment of the flat and pick it back up. If you don't, then it's really hard to figure out. Like, let's just say you rough in this slot and then you have to take it out and then it's going to be a little harder to get the slot indicated back in. You can definitely do it. But when you have the flat in there, when you put it up against the vice jaw, it automatically puts you back into alignment as long as your vice is nice and square. So other than that, that's the only thing that that thing is used for. Um, you might put it in a holder that's got a screw in it and, and a set screw in it. That's a, that's a good thing for it, but um, and most of the stuff that we have in, in R8 collets, it's not going to be an issue. Um, so the slot itself is not critical. 530 is what it is. The critical part of it is that the edge of the slot needs to be plus or minus two thousandths off center line. So here's, here's what, how this matters. If this diameter, two inches, 125, if you undersize it or oversize it, then your dimension from here to here changes. Let's just say you make it two inches, 150. First of all, you should have not done that. You should have taken it down to two inches, 125. Let's say make it two inches, 120. So now your center line dimension is not this nominal number. It becomes uh, one inch, 60 thousandths rather than one inch, 62 and a half thousandths. See what I'm saying? 
if whether don't just go off of the number you have to go off of what the actual size of your part is okay so if your part is a little bit big a little bit small you need to adjust that when you're making that slot so what i would suggest doing is figuring out where the center of this slot is okay taking a half inch end mill a rougher running it through it should give you 15 thousandths on each side then i would bring in this side on the mill checking it across there like that now it will be in the vise at an angle so that you can mill that slot so you mill the flat across it mill the slot through it if you're going to be out of tolerance you need to be out of tolerance on this side of the slot if you're out of tolerance on this side of the slot it affects center line center line is, so the first thing that i check on these parts grab it put your calipers to it if it's on center line i know the rest of the part's probably going down now. So that's literally the first thing that I check. And it, it, you know, in all honesty, it probably makes me a little subjective. If the center line dimension's right, my assumption is that all your other dimensions are right. If your center line dimension's not right, my assumption is that probably all the rest of your dimensions are not right. Now, that can be wrong, so I'm, I will check everything on it. But usually that's what I see. Um, so you'll have, you, so your first operation, you're gonna mill this flat, mill it across there. Second operation, you're going to stand it up at an angle using an angle block. When you use the angle blocks, and I know you haven't done any of this in some of this, I'll have to show you. you know. So let's just say we put our, our vice jaw and our flat up against there like that. We're going to put it in at an angle. And remember, this is not it, but this is like it. We're going to then put the 15 degree angle block on the side because this thing is at 15 degree angle, G. We're going to put that angle block on top of it. You will be tempted to put the angle block on the bottom. It makes sense to do that. When you do that, you trap the angle block inside of it, and then um, if Eric is first, you guys are screwed because he'll have it trapped in there. If you will flip the angle block upside down and then indicate the top when you're done, you take it out and set it off. That's how you use the angle block. Okay. Um, and so then you'll fly cut across the top of that. That dimension's pretty pretty loose on there. Um, and then you'll mill the slot out. And there are a couple of hard things to do on the slot, and we'll talk about those more as we get closer to that. Um, the dimension to the slot, um, it, a lot of these a lot of these areas start here start to overlay each other. They start to get really hard to see. I would not be afraid to. Go back to the computer, zoom that up, make sure what you're seeing on there. And um, and then when you get to the final operation, which will be laying it back down uh, where your slot is up, you'll this will be in the rigid jaw and the vise probably. This will be in the movable jaw where you put it in sideways. This does not show a flat build across that where these tapped holes go, but you can put that in there if you want to. If you, if you think it's going to be easier to tap your holes by milling a quick little flat, then that is an okay thing to do. If you just want to spot drill it and go, then you can do that too. By just spot drilling and going, you end up with a deep spot drill on the insides, a shallow spot drill on the outsides because of radial. Um, but it won't affect anything at all. And the spot drill, the whole purpose of it is that just to get that drill drilled straight. Because if you don't spot drill first, then the drills, they, they go out like that. I want you to drill through there, and then I want you to power tap the tap holes. You'll be tempted to want to hand tap them. It's less scary. Uh, it feels safer. But it makes a sloppy hole. And the idea is that we get really good at doing these things. Power tapping is how we get really good, consistent holes. Before you take it out, use a thread gauge. Check it, make sure it's right, and be done. Okay. You guys have a power tap yet, have you? Uh, we yeah. have. We did. You did. Was it very good? Yeah. There was, yeah, there was, there was one. Good. It was like our second time on the person. Yeah. What was the reason? So, power tapping on the mill and the lathe are slightly different. Same theory though you know you're you you're kind of um, once that tap starts to go 
Um, it's going to pull itself down. You're going to help it along. It's doing the work. Um, you can stretch the thread out if you're not careful. Uh, probably more than anything of what happens is people bottom the tap out in the hole. <laughs> yeah. Or just breaks. Yeah, it either, it either just blows out all your threads. Um, I, I've also seen it when people had the quill all the way down. And they're tapping the hole, and then the quill runs out of travel. And then they're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? And it stripped all out by that time. And I'm like, all right, think about everything that you got here. Quill should always be up as close as it can be. Because the further it gets out, the more that everything just shakes and moves around. Okay. Um, let's go back. So just real quick, we'll look at a couple of um, quick slides on the vertical mill just to make sure we know what we're talking about. Um, really, terminology is probably the most important thing here. First thing when you go to the mill, <clears throat> I'd say this is, this is the same thing I said yesterday about the lathe, um, or before about the lathe. You want to make sure, um, do a walk around this thing. Last thing you want to do is get all set up, and then you're like, there's no spindle motor on this thing. And it won't start. So that makes that makes life suck. So do a walk around it, make sure that everything's there. Um, and your Cartesian coordinate system works like this or like this, depending on how you want to do it. Z is your up and down, Y is your in and out, X is your back and forth. Okay. This is the knee. The knee is what you raise and lower. And even though it's easier to bring the quill down. It's much more rigid when you bring the knee up. When you bring the knee up, you always want to end on a full stroke up. If you lower the knee all the way down or down some, you also want to end on an upstroke. That sets pressure up against there in the right direction. Because what you don't want to have happen is this thing just go clump as you're machining and not notice it. Might only be five thousandths. And you mill this whole thing out and you're like, why is this like this is zero and this is five? What's going on? So we'll make sure of those things. Um, when you're milling um, or do really doing any kind of machine processes, you want to lock those axes that are not in movement down. So lock them down nice and tight. Oftentimes, let's just say on the X, Y, or Z, almost all of them have two, uh, two locks. There are some that one of the locks doesn't work, but as long as you got one lock down, you're good. Also, when you come over to the machine, it doesn't show it here, but on this side, the left-hand side, there should be a, a one-shot pump over there. If you pull the handle down, if you make sure that it has oil in it, and then pull the handle down, it then has a metering, um, or it has pressure, where it pushes oil into metering um, orifices throughout the machine. It'll help lubricate the machine. Lots of times people are like, oh man, I forgot to do that. I'll get it next time. The person who comes after that, after you, does the same thing. The person after you does the same thing. And then you, three months later, they're like, gosh, man, this, I can't hardly move this Y axis, or I can't hardly move this Z axis, or whatever. It's because it was getting oil. This is your quill feed. Um, I don't want you to use quill feed, auto feed, right now. But you can definitely use it as you would a drill press um, to take care of doing any kind of drilling or just adjustment and movement. Um, on the mill head itself, all of our machines are variable speed. Um, we do have one, what I call belt slapper. Um, it's a jet. Uh, some of the mills, even that you buy now, uh, they're not variable speed where you change the RPM. You actually have to slide the motor out, adjust the belts to different places, push the motor back, and so it's got RPM ranges where it's not infinitely variable. Um, ours have a wheel on them. Uh, you've got to you spin that wheel while the motor's spinning. Don't spin it while it's not spinning, um, while the motor's not spinning, because you'll end up with some problems. It does happen. Some uh, some mills have a nice little digital control on them, similar to our um, drill presses. Just turn it to the RPM that you want. It's great until it's not. You know, anything. The more bells and whistles that you put on it are awesome. They're also just a potential break point. Um, on ours, um, a lot of them have been spun so many times that the RPM isn't right. 
we'll start to kind of develop out what does this sound like, what does the chip look like, to see if we're actually getting a good right chip or not. Uh, it might be spinning at 3,000 RPM, but it might say 20,000, or it might say 200 RPM. Um, but when that plate gets spun, what happens is the person will crank that all the way around, and I, I can show you what the inside of it looks like. There's a there's a knob, and it, it cranks. It's got a chain on it, and it cranks this rod, and it moves this pulley in and out. If you crank it so much, the chain flips to the other side, and then all of your RPMs are jacked up. So you can fix it by reversing it and putting it back, um, but you don't know if that's why it's off or not. You know, so you almost have to pull it off of it, see it, and put it back together. So, uh, uh, in, in 30 years of doing this, almost every mill I've come up to has had a wrong RPM thing on it. So, it's not just us, it's everywhere you go to. So, if you go walk into a shop and you turn it to 300 RPM, it may or may not be there. Um, so, you know, just be cautious of that. Um, Draw bar goes through there, uh, 7 16 20 on the threads. That's the same threads on the R8 collet. Make sure that those are good and nice and smooth. If you have a problem where you're like, hey, my draw bar is too short and I can't get the, the handle on it, um, your quill is probably down. And because when it does that, it draws the whole thing down and then bring your quill back up. Yes, sir. Why uh, auto feed? Um, okay, we'll look at it. All right, um, that's, okay, there's the one shot coolant. Power feed across the X axis only, unless you were on that one singular mill. Um, it actually has power feed on Z now. If you need to move the head in and out, you can. Um, one of the things that we're going to make sure that we do every single time we come up to the mill. What's that? Yes, trim the head and table. Okay, so we want to make sure that the head is square in both directions according to the table. Put the vise, square the vise up. If, and so every day when you get done, your vise should be unbolted and left there loose. Okay, so oftentimes people don't do that. And then, because they're 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 just kind of gambling. I used it today. I'm gonna hope nobody else changes anything. I'm gonna come back to it tomorrow. I'm gonna risk it. Um, I'm gonna tell you, 75% of the time, it is either out because I knocked it out, or because some ding dong got on there after you, and was just murdering that thing. And your vice got out, your head got twisted, something like that. Uh, I've actually seen people mill. Nobody else use it come in the next day and just have the head sag enough that it was out, depending on how far the head hung out. So the further the head hangs out, the more gravity starts to affect it. Um, it's rare, but I have seen it where it just it just wasn't in anymore. And somebody will say, did you knock this out 2000s? I'm like, if I'm gonna knock it out, I'm not knocking it out 2000s. If I'm gonna knock it out, I come by there with a big old freaking giant dead blow and I just freaking hit the vices and you know shift them over. It's almost always visible. Um, same thing with the with the heads. If I'm gonna knock the heads out, one, I'm probably gonna knock all of them out, and they're gonna be visibly out. I'm not. I'm probably not gonna knock it a degree out. You know, um, I'm probably gonna knock it into a way that like you're gonna see it. All right. Um, Use the brake, use the quill stop, all those things we'll talk about when we're out there. No quill feed, at least not now. Let's trim the head in. Uh, use that digital readout as much as you can. Um, you've got dials on the ends and here and Y. Um, Z is the only place where you'll actually have to use it because we don't have digital readout in Z. So, um, but use digital readout. Um, I see people use digital readouts wrong all the time because what they've done is handicap themselves, and you've probably done this. Rather than on the lathe, rather than going in, touching the diameter, measuring it, and saying it's 1.2 set, you hit zero. 
and you just go, I'm going to take 10 off, it's 4.24, I'm going to take 10 off, it's 4.23, take 10 off, it's 4.22. And what happens when you're trying to do all that mental math, you end up with potential problems. So rather than zeroing, put the diameters in, same thing here, make sure you put your diameters in, or your dimensions in. All right, that just is lubrication stuff. Okay, so I will not bore you to death with just slides. Let me see if there's any ones that I think are just intensely important to do. No. Um, that's tramming. We'll go over more of that as we do it. And I think you guys have already done a little bit of that anyways. All right. So module two is this week. You got all week to do it. Um, you can never do it. You can do it on the last week. Uh, but I think you'll have the best results if you try to do it while we're doing these things. If you do it and then you don't get a really great score on it, um, then you can always go back and redo it. If you do it um, and you know, then it's just done. If you don't do it and then you die tomorrow, probably won't matter anyways. So there's that's the justification for waiting till the very end. You could die at week seven and then you did all of that work for nothing. It's valid. So, all right, questions? Probably about a thousand questions. Okay, that'd be fine. Um, yeah. When do you think that you will be done with your... Um, screw jacks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Hopefully by the end of this week. Yeah, by the end of this Thursday, week. Friday. Thursday, Friday. You're going to come out on Friday? Thursday. I'm going to probably eat it on Thursday. Okay. Let's shoot for Wednesday. Okay. And if, if it takes till Thursday, it's okay. okay. Um, and then go ahead and start to be thinking kind of mentally about what's going on with uh, the fly cutter. So it's easy turning really is. Um, and then if I think from that point on, you are primarily mill for the rest of the, some, the, rest of the eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So um, really a bunch of stuff on the lathe for 101s. Then we start with the lathe and move to the mill. And then we find ourselves pretty heavy mill um, until 104. And then they find themselves going back and forth a lot more. So, all right, that's it. Get out there and get to it.